So not to scare you with a uh, um, geometric figure here, but it starts off the discussion fairly well, if you remember anything about geometry. Um, proportions are um, two fractions, literally, that are equal to each other. So in this triangle, um, this line is parallel to this line. And because of that, then these two triangles, this one being the small triangle, and then, of course, uh, the big triangle, are in proportion to one another. So we can say that this length, AD, divided by this length, uh, DE, is going to equal, um, let me erase some of this, It's going to equal, and I have two choices in this case. Um, the AD was related to this side, so this length, which is AB, over this length, which is BC. So this triangle would be cut into proportions. And what happens is, if I move this line segment towards um, that top vertice, then the side AD is going to shrink, and if this number shrinks, then this one also has to shrink to account for being equal to this fixed ratio AB over BC. Um, and then, of course, if it goes the other direction, then AD is getting bigger, and if AD is getting bigger, then that forces DE to also become bigger to keep this fraction um, balance. And that's the only reason I like talking about geometry, because you can kind of physically see what's going on. All right, so a proportion literally is two fractions that are equal to each other. And they really only become um, nice for us if there's a few numbers involved. Um, another way to set up a proportion, um, though most people don't see it really clearly this way, is usually after you set up a proportion, you're going to what's called cross multiply. Now I have warnings about cross multiplication. It only works if you have a one fraction on the left, one fraction on the right, and there's an equal sign in between them and nothing else. You can't cross multiply in any other situation. So a fraction equal to a fraction. So if you do cross multiply, then it is, it doesn't matter what order you go in, you can go A times D or D times A. So I'll get AD is equal to, and then B times C. So this is also considered a proportion. Um, this is much easier to determine that you have a fraction equal to a fraction. And it's also easier to determine if A gets bigger, so does B. Um, down here in this product, it gets a little bit more confusing and there's other products that are not um, a proportion, or what this one is called is a direct proportion. So the product one is nice, it's just the um, directness or indirectness of it is a little confusing. All right, but we are going to be using the setup for indirect because it's literally easier to set up in that form. So I would do direct proportion is the fraction equal to a fraction, and indirect proportions I would set up um, I would set up as a product. Okay, so now direct proportions is basically as one gets big. other gets big. Kind of like what I was saying with the uh, triangle, if we moved it so that um, DE got shorter, then the other one also has to get shorter, and if I made it bigger, then the other one also has to get bigger. Um, indirect is as one gets big, the other gets small. And a, a good example of this one is if you increase the speed of your car, and in other words, you're going to go faster and faster, you decrease the time it takes you to get someplace. Though not as much as you might think. And we'll talk about that later. All right. 
So now that we have proportions, we can actually set up proportions to do unit um, conversions. So if you have um, some medicine that requires 8 milliliters per 15 kilograms, and you know your patient weighs 73 kilograms, then what you have up here is X milliliters. And this is literally what's considered a direct proportion setup. Milliliters are on the top, kilograms are on the bottom, and there's an equal sign in between these two fractions. So to solve this type, this is uh, different than the conversions we were doing before. Before, we would have a time sign here and actually multiply by the flip of this thing so my milliliters would go away or something like that. All right, so we're going to cross multiply and we're going to get 8 times 73, and I'll put that on this side is equal to x times 15, and I'll put that on this side. One thing I don't like about this method is you'll notice that I don't have any measurements anywhere um, because x times 15 would give you milliliter kilograms, and 8 times 73 would also give you milli milliliter kilograms, so it really doesn't make any sense. So when you're solving a proportion, you lose your measurements and when you get to the end you have to kind of go back to the beginning and go hmm i wonder what x was and you have to go back here and say oh x was a milliliter um, so that's one thing i don't like about this method but most people do use this to convert between units all right and then to solve for x the operation between 15 and x is multiplication so to undo multiplication you're going to divide so i'm going to divide both sides by 15. And you always divide by the number that is next to the variable, not anything else. So, all right, so to solve for x, we're going to get x is equal to, and then I'll have to type in my calculator. So 8 times 73 divided by 15 is about 38.9. So we're going to get 38.9. Now, one reason I don't like doing conversions this way is you have to remember where this x was in relationship to everything else, and you have to determine that its measurement is milliliters by looking back at the top. So this is 38.9 milliliters. One of my favorite ones um, that I've been getting into lately is uh, cooking rice. And the back of the package says um, two cups of rice and three cups of water. And I did this once. And what I found was it makes way too much rice for you know, just me. Um, so what I did, kind of in my head, um, it's two cups of rice and three cups of water. And I wanted to kind of um, change it up. So if I did 1.5 cups of rice, I wanted to know how much water. So I just wanted to reduce it a little bit, not you know, a terrible a lot. So you would cross multiply and you'd get 2 times x is equal to 3 times 1.5. And again, be really careful. You have to have the same measurements on the top and the same measurements on the bottom. So if I divide by 2, might as well show the step. Divide by 2, divide by 2. Um, I get 3 times 1.5 divided by 2. 0.5 divided by 2. And I come up with 2 and a quarter, 2.25. So that means um, when I do mine, I'm going to add 2 and a quarter cups of water. And therefore, I've changed the recipe. One way of talking about um, two of rice and three of water is you talk about it as parts. So I'm going to need a new page here. So we can say two parts rice, three parts water. So basically what that means is you can have any container 
that measures whatever. You could grab a bowl out of your cupboard, um, a coffee mug, and the two parts rice would be two coffee mugs. How do you spell coffee? And down here you would have three coffee mugs of uh, water. And if you did this, the rice would cook perfectly fine. Um, I did find some problems going a little bit smaller because my rice cooker has a fixed size. Um, so you can't get too small and obviously you can't get too big in a rice cooker. But if you know a ratio in terms of, you know, cups to cups, then you can always change it to anything to anything. It doesn't matter what measuring device you use. It should work out perfectly fine. So let me talk about direct proportions before I jump into indirect proportions, which I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, a direct proportion, which would be really nice if it was enacted, which is also known as a flat tax, is if you have an income, uh, let's call it income one, and on that income you are going to pay a tax. And if you change your income to something larger maybe next year, then obviously your tax is going to get larger. So when we get to indirect proportions, in, I can't even spell today, indirect, we can't do, you know, tax one over income one is an indirect because as your income goes up, your taxes go up. So an indirect one would be more like that um, distance equals rate times time, you know. If you go faster in a car, then your time is going to go uh, down if you hold your distance constant. So basically, if you're driving to work every day, then that distance usually is the same because you drive the same path. And the only thing that you change is how fast you go. And when you change how fast you go, then your time automatically changes. So if we try to set that up, um, let's call it big R not little r. So if we have a rate or a speed one, and I try to put that over time one, and let's say we change our rate going to work to rate two, and then we say, well, let's we'll see if that changes time two. So if rate one, or yeah, rate one over time one is a fixed number, and we change rate two to go faster, then if it was a direct proportion, then the time would also increase, and that doesn't make sense. Because if you go faster, you should be saving time. So it's best not to um, set up a indirect proportion as a proportion fraction. It's actually easier to set it up as a proportion product. So we're going to change it to rate one times time one, equals rate two times time two. And then this one works out a little bit better because rate times time is your distance. And this is basically just saying your distance on the left is the same as the distance on the right. Okay. So if you drove at 50 miles per hour, oh, let's make it 55. Raise 55. I don't remember any speed limits being 50. 55 miles per hour, and it takes you 23 minutes to get to work. I want to know what happens if I increase my speed to 70 miles per hour. Um, I want to know how much time it would take me to get to work. Now, what's cool about this um, problem is you don't have to do unit conversions. Because um, here, remember, when we're doing unit conversions, miles per hour, you know, miles per hour, if I wanted to multiply by something, I would have to get rid of the time frame, so I'd have to multiply by hours. But here I'm multiplying by minutes. So let's say I had to go through and, well, convert. If I had to convert, and I'm going to erase this in a second, if I had to convert, minutes into hours, I would have to write this as 23 over 60, and then that would be an hour. So that means my time two, I would also have to write it as time two over 60. 
So both sides would have this divide by 60 on it, and it's all multiplication on both sides. So technically, I could just multiply both sides of the equation by 60, and we're back to the equation that I've already set up. So as long as the um, rates, the 55 miles per hour, the speeds, um, and 70 miles per hour are measured exactly the same, and the times are also measured exactly the same, it doesn't matter what units the times and or the rates are in, this formula will always work. It's kind of a neat feature. All right, let's get rid of this. And let's solve it. So to solve this equation, we're trying to solve for T2 over here, and it's being multiplied by the 70 miles per hour. I'm going to drop the 70 uh, the miles per hour. So we're going to divide both sides of this equation by 70. So in my calculator, I'm going to do 55 times 23 divided by 70. 55 times 23 divided by 70. So about 18. 0.1 if you really want to get precise. Um, so this would be uh, this color. T2 would equal 18. And then because T1 was measured in minutes, T2 is automatically measured in minutes. So if you drove 15 miles per hour faster to work, which pretty much means you're probably breaking the speed limit and uh, risking a ticket, you're saving... The amount of time you're saving is 23 minus 18, better known as 5 minutes. So if you're willing to get a ticket just to save yourself 5 minutes, it's really not that much time, um, then go right ahead now. That's 15 miles per hour of the speed limit. So I kind of um, love seeing people in a 70 mile per hour zone um, do about 80 miles per hour knowing that they're only going to save like maybe two minutes. Because the funny thing about this formula is if you have a fixed distance, you don't save the same five minutes. Like if you did 85 miles per hour instead of um, 70 miles per hour, another 15 mile per hour bump, you don't save five minutes. You save less than five minutes. So every increase in speed does not give you the same decrease in time over a fixed distance. It's kind of a cool property. So my story here, I guess, is there's no point in speeding. Another example of indirect proportions is um, making soup, basically, and putting in too much salt. So when I made soup the other day, I put in three teaspoons of salt, but the recipe only called for two teaspoons for the five cups of soup that I was making. How much more broth needs to be added to fix this mistake? In other words, I need to dilute the amount of salt that's in the um, container already. So the formula that's going to work on this one looks a lot like um, the previous one. Uh, what T? I was thinking of the previous one. Um, didn't do anything. V2. So instead of R1, R2, um, R1, T1 equals uh, R2, T2, um, this one is C1, V1 equals C2, V2, where C is a concentration. So the mistake I made was three tablespoons of salt in my five cups of soup. That's the mistake I made. So I'm gonna make that the concentration. Now the concentration that I added was three teaspoons per five cups. And the volume is five cups. I added too much salt into my five cups. So the concentration is amount over volume. All right. On the other side, it was supposed to be two teaspoons per five cups. And I need to know I need to know the volume I need to get this to so that my concentration is correct. Now one of the things that's weird about this is that per five cups on both sides. So what I could do is multiply both sides by five cups. That's legal. Whatever you do to the left side of an equation, you do to the right. And then these five cups will cancel. 
So that kind of simplifies my formula a little bit. This becomes 3 times 5 is equal to 2 times v sub 2. So the 3 times 5 represents my concentration, um, or if I left the 5 cups in there, it represents the amount of salt that I have on that side. So I need the right-hand side to also multiply out to be the amount of salt on the right-hand side, but with the right concentration. Um, so to solve for V2, it's going to be 3 times 5 divided by 2. So we're going to get V sub 2 is 15 halves, better known as 7.5. And because V1 was measured in cups, this is cups. So to fix my mistake, I need to increase my cups from 5 and add in a little bit more until I get up to 7.5. So that would be you know, 7.5 minus 5, better known as 2.5 cups. Therefore, you would have to add 2.5 cups to your soup to balance out the amount of salt that you, well, for my soup, to balance it out so it would taste properly. I like defining percents as a proportion. It gives us a lot of flexibility, and it'll lead into, uh, well, shortcuts to help us solve some problems. But it all starts off as a proportion to begin with. So the way I define it um, is, uh, literally is over of equals x out of 100. And the x here is the percent. Because the definition of percent, if you think about it, Percent, you know, that word per is that fraction bar, and cent is like century or cents, how many cents are in a dollar, um, means a hundred. So in another language, it would be out of a hundred. So that's why x is um, a percent, because it's out of a hundred. All right, so this is the formula we're going to work with. And the way it works is we could have a question that says um, 7 is what percent of uh, 63? Okay, so that would be my question. And then to answer it, I would just use my little formula up here. The number that is next to the word is, or associated with the word is, goes in that position. So it's 7 over. The number that is next to of, over here the of 63, goes in that bottom position. Um, the 100 is always there. Don't ever change that, because that's that percent part. And we're solving for x. So to solve this equation, we could cross-multiply, but that actually um, adds a step in that I want to kind of skip. But we could just multiply both sides of this equation by 100. That's totally legal. You know, do it to the left, do it to the right. And what happens is... This 100 divided by that 100 is 1. 1 times x is x. And then on the other side, you just multiply by 100, so it becomes 700 over 63 is equal to x, which, by the way, is a percent. So when we write this, we're going to put the percent symbol after it. And then figure out what 700 over 63 is. So 11.1, so x is going to equal 11.1%. So that's one way um, that this proportion works out. So another simple example, uh, let's split it here, would be, uh, let's say we have what number? is 8% uh, of 70. Okay, so we would set it up the same way. We would, uh, you know, the number that is associated with is. Now, some people get confused here. You know, is is really close to that 8%. You just have to remember that x represents that percent. So it can't be the is number. So it says what number is, so the number is the unknown, and I like using n for number. So n goes in place of is, 
the of number is 70. The percent is 8. I'll drop the percent sign because I'm going to divide by 100. That becomes my way of figuring out how to change a percent back into a number is drop the percent sign and divide by 100. I don't talk about moving decimals. All right, here we want to solve for n, so we're going to multiply both sides by the number underneath it, 70. And if I multiply both sides by 70, the 70 on this side goes away. 70 divided by 70 is 1. And we get n equals um, 8 times 70 divided by 100. So I'm going to do 8 times 8, 8 times 70 divided by 100. So 5.6. So the number, 5.6, that is 8% of 70 is this one. All right, so this kind of leads into uh, a few other ideas with uh, shortcuts if we look at it correctly. So one of the shortcuts, I'll leave it on this page until I talk about it, um, comes from this side, and the shortcut is this. 7 over 63 is a fraction, and when we multiplied it by 100 at this step here, we changed it into a percent. So to change a fraction to a percent, divide and multiply by 100. Okay, so that's really important for the rest of the course. If you ever want to change a fraction into a percent, you divide the top one by the bottom one, and you multiply your answer by 100, and at the very end you're going to tag on that nice little percent sign to say, this is not the value of the number, this is just a percent. Don't get confused. Percents are not numbers. They represent numbers. Um, on the other side, it said, you know, what number uh, is 8% of 70? That's how you find the percent of a number. So to find the percent of a number, what did we do? Well, we took that number. We multiplied it by, I'm sorry, we took that, ah, okay. We took the number, we multiplied it by the percent, and then we divided by 100. So to find the percent of a number, multiply by the percent, multiply by percent, and divide by 100. I'll write these over again um, on another page. I just wanted to talk about those two right away. So that leaves one more possibility, and that possibility is um, the bottom number. But that's not as important as it seems. We'll see. I might just delete that too. The um, last possibility of is over of um, equals x over 100, where x is a percent, is this question here, you know, 6 is 15% of what number? Now, I usually don't um, do it with the is over of, but let's see what happens. So the is number is the 6. The of number is of what number, so I'm going to put an n down there. Um, the x is the 15, dropping the percent sign, over 100. All right, so here, sadly, I have to cross multiply, and that's why I usually don't set it up this way. I'll set it up algebraically some other way. So if we cross multiply, we're gonna get 15n is equal to 600. And this is the step I wanted to avoid by cross multiplying earlier, but this one you have no choice um, but to cross multiply. So I'm gonna multiply or divide both sides by 15 to get the n by itself. 15 divided by 15 is one. And we're going to get n is equal to 600 divided by 15. All right, so trash, 600 divided by 15, 40. That's a nice number.
on you like my decimal ones. So 6 is 15% of 40. Now, again, like I said, this I don't like doing. Um, probably because uh, on the previous page we said to find the percent of a number, we just multiply by the percent and divide by 100. So what I could do is 15% um, times my number divided by 100 is equal to um, 6. And then turn around and solve for n from here. I like doing it algebraically rather than proportionally. Um, it really doesn't matter which way you go about it. So this would become 0.15n is equal to 6, and then divide both sides by 0.15. And it'll turn out to be the exact same answer. Um, I'm just more algebraically inclined than to do um, a lot longer problem on the left-hand side here. All right, and I said earlier I would uh, write out the steps a little bit better. So here's to change a fraction into a percent. And a lot of people are like, ah, I don't need this. But it's amazing how many people make silly mistakes. Also, this one becomes the one that uh, you don't know that you have to do it all the time because we work with decimal numbers for everything. Um, and later, you're going to be kind of confused when you should change something into a percent and what you shouldn't. So you always have to focus on, am I dealing with a number or am I dealing with a percent? And if I'm dealing with a percent, I'll have to go through these steps. So to divide the top number by the bottom, um, that'll change it into a decimal value. You're going to multiply that by 100. That'll literally change it into a percent. And you have to put the percent symbol after that number to finish off the conversion. All right. All right, for an example on this, how to change a fraction into a percent, I decided on real life data. So this data here is um, the deaths that have been recorded um, by, uh, by COVID-19. So these are people that have, um, were verified to have the disease and also died from it. So there are 92,944 deaths total so far on May, um, what day is today? May 21st, 2020. Okay, so one of my questions would be something like, uh, what percent of deaths, I know this is very morbid, but it's realistic, were women? So let's go for the whole thing. I'll ask a few other questions about the table. So we need to know um, the percent of women that died, and then we'll compare it to the percent of men, and then I'll answer some other questions based on this table. Those are the two easiest ones. Okay, so the percent of women is going to be um, the total number of women, which is this number down here, and it's going to be what percent of the deaths were women, so that would be out of all of them. So the fraction we're going to set up is 31,181 divided by 92,944. Okay, so if we type that in a calculator, let's see, 31,181 divided by 92,944. So this would be the division by uh, the top divided by the bottom. Then we're going to take that answer and multiply it by 100. So it comes out to be 33.5. So down here, I'm going to write 33.5. And the third step says, because you multiplied by 100, you have to put a percent sign. So I can put an equal sign as long as I put a percent sign and the fraction on the other side. If I left the percent sign off, these two numbers are not equal to each other. All right, so this would be the percent of women in the country that have died from COVID-19. Um, so what about men? So if I'm looking for the percent of men, I'll do this in a different color, orange, sounds good. Uh, the total number of men is 61,763 divided by the 92,944. So 61,763, it's a lot of people, 92,944. 
And then we're going to do the division, and then we're going to multiply by 100 and get it equal to a percent. Okay, so I can get my calculator. So 6, 1, oops, 6, 1, 7, 6, 3, divided by 92, 944, and then just times it by 100. So that's 66.5. Now, obviously, we could have done that a different way, 66.5, because, you know, 33.5 was women, so the other portion of the population must be men. That is a large concentration of the percentages on men, so this disease is affecting men much more drastically. Okay. Now, the last two examples based on this table were actually kind of simplistic because we were dealing with all the totals, you know, the total number of men, the total number of women, and the total population that has died. So this one's a little bit more precise, so we have to be careful how we read this problem. So this says, what percent out of the men? So right off the bat, your eyes should just be drawn to this one column. Everything else in the table is irrelevant. Those are the only numbers we're going to be looking at. In those numbers now, we have to find out um, the men that died if they were over 75 years old. So if they were over 75 years old, that's this number. So this is going to be the 29,479, those that were 75 years old or older that died, um, out of all of the men, because this said up here, out of the men. So our fraction is going to be 29... Uh, 479 divided by 61763. All right, so I'll bring and we want to do 29479 divided by 61763. Now that'll change it to a decimal, and of course we want to multiply that by 100 and come up with that. So this is equal to 47.7%. If you're a man that died from COVID-19, then you almost have a half a chance of dying because you were over 75 years of age. Kind of scary. So let's look at another way of um, grouping this data. Um, here I have what percent of people between the ages of 45 through 64 were women. So here, what our concentration should be on is this age group. And this age group goes left to right. So we're looking at these numbers. And then out of these numbers, we're interested in just the women. So if we're looking at that number, then the women number is the 7,207. So that's going to be the top of my fraction. The bottom of the fraction is the total of that whole column, which is the 21,000. So this is going to be 7,207 women out of that whole age group, which was 21,483. All right, so let's do this calculation. Uh, 7,207 divided by 21,483. Change it to, to a decimal, and then we're going to multiply by 100 to change it into a percent. So that's 33.5. So this is 33.5% of that age group that died were women. Okay. To find the percent of a number is actually you know, kind of easy also. Um, it's really important that you follow these steps, though, because if you don't, you're going to make some silly mistakes on certain types of problems. So take the percent that you're trying to take of a number and divide it by 100. That becomes the number you're going to use to multiply the number by that decimal. So um, one of the more common examples of uh, percent values is like tax. So in North Carolina, I think the tax is 6%. Depends on what county you live on. Some counties will add on or take away um, some of the tax. Uh, in North Carolina, 6% tax. How much will you pay for a $1,200 computer? 
So this is the case where you're going to have to take a percent of a number because tax is a percent of how much you're spending. Um, so we're going to go through and first we're going to take 6%. And when you divide it by 100, you can get rid of the percent sign because the percent literally means out of 100. All right, so you're going to do 6 divided by 100. Uh, that equals 0 0.06. And then you're going to take that number and multiply by the 1,200. So it's going to be 1,200 times 0 0.06. All right, so 1,200 times 0 0.06 is 72. So you'll have to pay $72 in tax to buy this um, computer. Well, when you go to the register, you're not going to pay $72 and walk out the door. You first have to pay for the computer, of course. And then you also have to pay North Carolina its share of the money. So you'll have to pay uh, $1,272 to buy that computer and walk out the door. Now, there's a shortcut to this. This is what I consider the eighth grade method of finding um, tax. I'll come back to the shortcut later on and it leads into another formula. So I made up this example to um, emphasize why it's really important to not use the old move the decimal around on percents. Um, because when people get to 0.02%, they start moving the decimal the wrong way. I have seen people take that decimal place and move it this way because they don't like seeing well, a decimal place, I guess. So the first step of finding the percent of a number, we're going to be finding 0.02% of 350 million. So 0.02% of the U.S. population um, have more than $10 million or are worth more than $10 million. Kind of goes back to my um, uh, Jeff uh, Bezos example. If the U.S. population is about 350 million, how many people are we talking about? So the first thing we need to do is take our percent number and divide it by 100. So this is literally the definition of 0.02% is 0 0.02 divided by 100. When you divide that by 100, it becomes 0 0.0002. And this is why people don't like moving the decimal the other way. That is a ridiculously small number. All right. So then you need to turn around and take that 0 0.0002 and multiply it by 350 million. So the way I'm going to write that is our scientific notation E6, where E6 represents a million. You could move the decimal place between the 3 and the 5 and write it as E8. Um, That's perfectly fine also. But in my calculator, I'm wondering if this calculator will do that. So I'm going to have to be a little bit long with this. 0 0.0002 times 350 times 10 to the 6. So we're talking uh, 70,000 people in the U.S. have that much money, based on my made-up problem here.